programs. Um, this is called Coffee and Cameras Online. This is brand new in terms of how we're presenting it. Um, each month, uh, we would partner with the Atlanta Film Society, and we would do a coffee and cameras program at the lab on Saturday mornings, once a month. Uh, usually uh, the last Saturday or the second to last Saturday of the month. And um, we would do it from nine o'clock to noon. And, the, and what would transpire was you'd come in, we would set, if you see a little picture out there of the uh, cinematographers outside of our lab, that's right in, um, in Atlanta. We would set the coffee ta table up there, have coffee, kind of get start building a film community in uh, Atlanta. Of uh, when I say film community, a celluloid film community, and and uh, we would meet, talk uh, about what's going on in the industry. Those who had never been had never been to the lab, we would tour the lab, and then uh, then we would give a presentation, presentation on different to each month. There was a different topic, and as I, uh, I mentioned earlier. This one, I just wanted to test to see how this will work out. And in the coming months, we would have different speakers on different topics relating to either cinematography, film and cinematography, film cameras, um, 16 millimeter film cameras or 35 millimeter film cameras. Uh, we did it on film loading. That's going to be quite challenging. So uh, I don't know if we can still do that. Um, but that's how we presented it in the, in the past. What we hope to do is continue this uh, in an online format. And then once it's get worked out, we could probably, uh, we hopefully can come back into the lab uh, and do it obviously with uh, the proper precautions taken. So uh, again, I want to thank Emma for allowing us to do this, the uh, Atlanta Film Society. Uh, for being so willing to allow us to do it online. And also uh, another uh, thank you to Emma for getting up on Saturday morning <laughs> and helping uh, troubleshoot this prior to our starting. A uh, couple of things I wanted to, uh, to say before we, are, we start. Um, first, I hope everybody's doing well and is safe uh, after this coronavirus uh, has struck the uh, not only Georgia, Atlanta, but the country and the world. Uh, so it's affected everybody. Uh, one silver lining, we're all, we're all in this together. So um, I hope you and your families are doing well because of that uh, during this time. Um, what is Kodak doing during this coronavirus uh, uh, challenging time? Right now we are, uh, the Kodak, as far as purchasing a Kodak motion, picture film you can still we're open for that we, we in other words you could um dial the 800 number and you still produce motion picture film from it. um in terms of the kodak film labs our kodak film labs are presently temporarily closed both in new york the uk and atlanta and the reason for that is as you can see the the industry hasn't come back uh yet uh, there's, I mean, whoever you talk to, uh, everybody has different opinions as far as winter resume. Um, I was hoping July, now it's looking at maybe production offices may open in August and productions may resume in the fall. Um, and when I say that, I'm, I say that in terms of the studio pictures, uh, the tentpole type of productions. But we are, so because of that, we are temporary closed. Um, having said that, I'll, I'll tell you what I am seeing is these smaller productions, when I say smaller, um, those who have owner operators of, of cameras, uh, those who do music videos, shorts, I'm starting to see those individuals uh, resume filming. Uh, and it's not a lot of film, but those were the type of customers we had before. And I'm starting to see that resume again, and I'm seeing it uh, in Miami. I'm seeing it in Nashville, and in uh, some in Atlanta as well. And when I and in most of it, if not all, is 16 millimeter, and uh, because you can get a, a small 16 millimeter camera 
either. Uh, as you see those three uh, individuals in front of our lab, those are all 16 millimeter cameras, uh, but also 100 foot cameras of 16. I see that resuming. Um, uh, the other thing I want to update everybody in terms of the, we had a contest, uh, we sponsored a contest with the Atlanta Film Society and the Atlanta Film Festival called uh, uh, six, uh, the 16 millimeter by 100 foot challenge. It was very successful in terms of the number of uh, entries. We had about, geez, I think 38 entries and we were supposed to have a screening, I believe it was going to be the beginning of March, uh, excuse me, the beginning of April at the plaza. Obviously, with the coronavirus and what's impacted theaters uh, and, and the plaza, we couldn't screen it there. And as you can imagine, theater, theater, uh, theaters as well as the art houses, which is the plaza theater, uh, I've been working nonstop trying to figure out different ways to either reopen or reinvent themselves. As you've probably been reading in the news, uh, the plaza theater has started drive-ins uh, in their parking lot. Or I, I believe they're trying to do pop-ups as well. Maybe Emma mentioned that. But um, I encourage you to support those screenings. But uh, as such, we're not sure when the plaza will open up. So what, in discussion with Chris at the Atlanta Film Society, we are considering showing the 100-foot contest uh, through a drive-in. So details to come. But uh, that's one of the plans to do. Um, okay. Um, and with that, what I'll do, if you don't mind, I'll start the presentation. And uh, let me, I'm going to, okay. can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and just uh, let you know, that's <clears throat> for those who have not been to Kodak Film Lab Atlanta, uh, we're at 2156 Faulkner Road. It used to be uh, Cinefilm for many, many years, 40 years. And uh, it's still there. And then what happened was three years ago, uh, it was at that point in time was owned by Crawford and then it was gonna close. And then Kodak Film Lab, uh, we made a decision, I'll probably start um, in the film business I say the film business not only still but motion picture uh obviously uh to do that we needed to support the infrastructure so that's why cine film and crawford became kodak film lab um and i'll get into a little later as far as the two facilities and the people who worked within those facilities as far as your experience um but let's uh, this part of this presentation is just I, I thought i'd talk a little about the history how we got from where kodak first started to where we are present um those who uh may not know uh kodak was started by this gentleman and all three of those pictures is the founder of kodak uh george eastman uh, and the, uh, you can see in different phases of his life. Uh, a lot of people think he is the inventor of photography. Uh, he is not the inventor of photography. He made photography and motion picture accessible to the masses. Uh, so he basically his expertise was in photography, but also how do you make it mass produced, but also make it easier. So it became less of an elitist type of tool and more so everybody could use it. And one of the uh, ways he did that was that little picture down in the right hand corner of the brownie camera. Okay, where did George Eastman start? Uh, George Eastman is from Rochester, New York. That's upstate New York. And again, I mentioned he didn't invent photography, he, but he was a photographer. He loved, that was his hobby. And back in the, in the days of still photography, in order to take a picture, uh, it was very challenging. You had to take uh, basically a glass plate. That's where you hear the base, and that's a base. Uh, and you would pour an emulsion on it. And then you would, uh, you know, if you see the days of the Civil War or, or the, that era, you, you know, they would have the big uh, camera with the black curtain behind it. Uh, you would put a plate in there, expose it, and no one could move. So the ASA had to be really low, a uh, slow. And... Uh, 
then you would process it. Uh, so those are those are the type of cameras that I see here uh, that was uh, being used at the time of George Eastman. And that, I'm talking about the uh, the late 1800s. And you can see the plate would go on the back and you'd remove the lens cap, take your picture. And if anyone moved, you'd see a blur. Uh, another way of putting images or an emulsion on a base you saw the plate but was also with uh, a metal a tin plate uh, and what george eastman decided to make it easier was dry plates that's what he was really targeting as far as instead of keep pouring emulsions onto a plate uh he would come up with and he worked with an engineer or some scientists over in england and got some of the copyrights for that and was able to come up with Eastman dry plates. It's it they're not wet plates, they're dry plates, so it's easier to to bring your camera around, but it's still very cumbersome. And that's a picture of George Eastman right there with one of his brownie cameras on a ship. So he's a dashing young man. But again, this is all uh, uh, using either dry plates or wet plates and it's still very cumbersome. What he was trying to figure out was how do you make film flexible so you could put so it's easier to use. And that was uh, what he was able to do was make flexible film. So instead of pouring an emulsion onto a plate or a a hard, a, a hard base, he was able to put on a flexible base so it bend and that's how he came up with the brownie cameras. And you would just roll the film, since you could bend it now, uh, you could put it in the box, and those are the brownie cameras, and then you would, they would, Kodak would roll the film into the brownies, purchase the brownie camera, we would send it to you, you would take pictures, you would send it back to Kodak, and we would process it, put a new roll of film into it, and send it back to you. So the, the motto was, you press the button, we do the rest. So he didn't necessarily, again, he didn't invent photography, but he made it more accessible to, so he went from these type of cameras to these, these cameras, which are a lot lighter, and that's how, boom, it, it took off as far as photography for the general public. Uh, now, we're all talking at this point stills, right? Uh, how do you take still images and make it magically look like they're moving. And, you know, if you look at through time, the different images uh, that were, or different ways to make still images look like they're moving, you could see that Lepraxin scope. Let me see if I could, oh, wait, hold on a second. Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to, okay, I'll keep it. I have right here uh, a Lepraxin scope. And if you look at that, let me see if I can hide that for a second. Okay, hold on. Okay. Can you see me now? And am I on a, a big screen or just a little screen? Uh, well, hopefully, uh, what I wanted to show you is this. This is a Praxin scope. And what this was is a toy, basically. But how it worked was you would see there's images circular in um, around the scope, but each like animation, each one of those images was slightly different from the preceding image. And how, now this is how you take a still image and pers and uh, magically make it look like it's moving. You 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 spin it. And if you're looking at the mirror, it gives the illusion that it's moving. And you're just taking a series of still images, but when you move it at a certain rate, voila, it, it creates moving images. And we've all done that. Well, I think all of us have done that with the little, uh, the flip charts, you know, you, you, you have like little caricatures and you move them. Each one is a little different and you move it at a certain speed. It gives the illusion of moving. And that's, 
that was everybody wanted to do that and they were like oh, how do we do that how, how do you do that as far as with motion picture film so i'll, I'll show the next slide how that there's the famous um analysis of trotting horses it was a bet of uh does all four legs of a horse move off the ground and how that was uh that bet was finally uh finalized or decided upon was they put a, took a series of still image of still cameras and as the horse went by each one of the cameras was triggered as the horse went by and when they put it all together and then put it on something like a, a lapraxin scope you could see that the images of uh, that four legs were indeed off the ground so uh that's one of the famous things as far as okay moving images now there. Uh, the two gentlemen that I, I mentioned earlier, George Eastman is on the, uh, if your screen be left, holding the film. And uh, I guess he wasn't a good film loader because you would never feed film like that into a motion picture camera. Um, on the right was Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison invented the, uh, in, in, this, in, uh, in addition to the light bulb, uh, a phonograph, which showed music and you you probably see those edison uh plastic or wax tubes and they play music he thought wouldn't it be nice if i could have images to the music and uh as a result of that it would sell more phonographs so his intent was not so much to make movie pictures or movie cameras it was really the intent of come up with this movie camera so he would sell more phonographs. And I'm thinking about it, he, it's really like the mu first music videos because he really wanted to sell his phonograph and the sound that came out of it. And he figured the way to do that is to show moving images. Um, so I was like, oh wow, the first music video. So he knew about, or one of his assistants knew about what George Eastman was doing up in Rochester as far as flexible film. So Thomas Edison worked with his engineers, came up with the motion picture camera, and then provided to uh, George Eastman would start making some flexible film to go in this camera. Now, at that time, George Eastman wasn't making um, 35 millimeter motion picture film. He was making, the film was like 120 uh, in, in width. So Thomas Edison or George Eastman, George Eastman said, well, what size of film would you like to go through this camera? And they figured a 35 millimeter width would be ideal. So that's where they came up with 35 millimeter. Because trying to take a large format and put it through the film camera would be, you would need more film in there, it'd be more cumbersome. Uh, nowadays, 65 millimeter is, is on, it's coming back. But at that point, it was even wider than 65. But that's how they came up with 35 millimeter. Um, slide. So uh, they start making motion picture film, and and let me know. Do you want me to uh, enlarge this uh, slide, or do, is it fine the way it is? Okay. Um, is, let me just. Is, uh, is there any way we can make it full screen? Yeah. Thank you. It's just a little hard to see from there, okay. from here. <laughs> Okay. All right. So you start, uh, Thomas Edison started making motion picture films in New Jersey. Uh, anyone been up in New Jersey? I encourage you to see the Edison Museum in um, uh, South Orange, New Jersey. It's, it's fantastic, uh, as well as they have a replica of the Black Mariah. And that's actually where uh, he started making motion picture films. It's a big contraption. Uh, uh, it's all um, like octagon shape with a removable roof and you would rotate it around and uh, it's pretty cool. But when he made films, how do you show them? Uh, there was no theaters as we know it. Uh, so what they did was going back to the old the, that little toy to love Praxin scope. Well, if I can just put film in this box, look at it, and then rotate the images at a certain speed, 
like say as your eye sees roughly 24 frames per second, it gives the illusion of movement. So they have what this, what we call uh, these little devices were put in theaters and it costs a nickel to step up and view it. And that's where the Nickelodeon came from. And so again, they weren't being projected. So now theater owners start saying, I could fit a lot more people into my business uh, if I projected it versus having people look at Nickelodeon. So they came up with theaters where you can project film. Uh, I believe the first one was done over in ooh, is it the Lumineer Brothers, I believe, in France. They projected the first motion picture film. So now it's it just as a business model, you see all those seats uh, versus people lining up to watch Nickelodeon's uh, paying five cents. So uh, it made more sense. And it, it's a better theatrical experience. Even present day, I'd rather watch it projected in the theater versus looking at, and I get a kick out of this. I just, again, just forgive this, but yeah, you know, I look at this, this is basically like the iPhone of its day, because <laughs> that's how we look at movies now on our iPhone, about the same dimension. But uh, so it went from there, and now it's going back to iPhones again. But that's how the theatrical experience came about. Now, that picture right there, I, I show this because a lot of people don't realize that Kodak is based in uh, Rochester, New York, and that's where we make all our motion picture film. And that's that building right there with no windows, obviously film sensitive to light. That's where that's the coding alleys. And that's where emulsions, uh, the light sensitive emulsions are coded onto the base. And it's been doing, we've been doing that for over 100 years. So any questions at this point? I find it interesting that there are absolutely no windows on that yep. building rather than into your rooms for the um, Kodak the light sensitivity. Yep. Mm -hmm. that, uh, well, that makes, it makes sense. It's just that. Yeah. Uh, though I would think nowadays you have a nice, like a, um, I look at that going, that should be a mural or something, something a little bit. Uh, in, in fact, it may, it may at this point be. Uh, so, but that's, uh, now, I'll be quite honest with you, a lot of those buildings have come down through the years because Kodak has, uh, the film industry is not as big as it once was. So as such, a lot of those uh, buildings are no longer standing, but that coding alley is, and several of other buildings are still there. But that is the only place, it's scary but to say this, but this is the only place in the world that makes uh, motion picture film. And we still make still film there. Okay. Now, when we make motion picture film, uh, going back to that image where you saw a coating a, an emulsion onto a glass plate, uh, when we make an emulsion, let's so say a color negative film, uh, we make the emulsion and think of it as uh, we're cooking. We make it in a, a bat and then we pour it onto a base flexible base and it's like a carpet uh think of it as a carpet or a cookie dough and from that we cut it up to any with origination with that customers prefer in other words if you see here uh it goes from super 8 to 16 to 35 to 65 the point i'm trying to make here is the super 8 film emulsion is the same thing as the 65 millimeter emulsion. It's just the way we cut it up. Uh, to use an another analogy, it's like a, a pie of pizza. Uh, it, it's all the same uh, dough, the same sauce, the same cheese. It, it, it just, and the same taste, it's just how you cut it, it cut it up. Okay. When we started, it was all um black and white film and then as the years went by uh there were there was a call for color images because obviously we see color now how do you transfer light color light 
into a motion picture or into a film in, in, in itself. And you use color theory because as, as you know, there, there's additive colors, subtractive colors. And motion picture film or film in general uses the subtractive colors that yellow, cyan, magenta, any combination of that can make any other, making any other color. Um, additive colors, that's like printers. They, if you look at the, your TV screen, you'll see red, green, blue. And the, any combination of that can make any other colors. So, but we work with film, we work off the of subtractive colors. So how do you take that and make film? Well, there used to be uh, some filmmakers had used um, filters and you would kind of get like a red tint or uh, a sepia tone tint to it. Nice effect, but it still wasn't true color. And again, work, working off the additive and subtractive, again, that's how film works. We designed film with a base and using three, hold on a second, three different uh, uh, color layers of magenta, yellow, and cyan. And just to show you that, let me uh, kind of go back. Slide here. I have my little toys here. Give me a second. Sorry about that. Okay. To show you how that works. And those who have visited our lab, you, you've all received one of these, uh, these things. Uh, and if you would like one, just email me and your address and I'll be happy to send one to you. But uh, I show this because this is three separate sheets of film. One is magenta, one is cyan, and one is yellow, okay? Individually, it's just recording that one specific uh, reference of color. But adding those images together, that gives you the positive image. I'm sure you really can't see too well here. Uh, but that's how we make color negative film. It's just three layers of film. And the three layers are red, uh, excuse me, cyan, magenta, and yellow. And that's how we make color film. Now, you've probably heard about the Technicolor process. Uh, the Technicolor process was three black and white films running through the camera uh, at the same time, <laughs> really cumbersome. And uh, if you see Gone with the Wind, that was Technicolor. And as the light would come through the lens, it would split the images into the different color records. And then when it was processed, you would add the color later on. And that's it. And that's why the images look so great because they're preserved in black and white. And that's the one thing about black and white film. It's a great way to preserve images for the future. And a lot of studios do that. They make black and white separations because black doesn't. And in recording, like I took the, this uh, frames of film, you would take black and white film and record yellow, magenta, cyan, each three, uh, three separate records. And then, and then put that in a vault, and that would last for a longer period of time than with just a color print film. Um, any questions? Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you about this, you see the, different, the three different color layers, uh, but also within each yellow, magenta, cyan, there's actually a fast layer, a medium speed layer, and then a slow layer. And so we have within each color layer, within, within each specific color, there's three, three to four layers uh, that capture different amounts of light. But you also notice these little um, dark spots. These dark spots are what is attracting people to film. And we've actually seen a, a resurgence in music videos and in short films and in film in general. Uh, to capture to light, we need silver. 
And these are silver halide crystals. And after they're processed, the silver is removed. But it gives you that, uh, and it's funny because it used to be a detraction to the image, but now it's more of a beauty mark and it's called grain. Um, and that's, so part of the process, and I think I have, uh, let me see. Uh, part of the process is, in our color negative process is removing silver. And, uh, we, and we do that in the bleach part of the process. So you heard uh, occasionally bleach bypass. Bleach bypass is where you skip over the bleach. So you're keeping the, some of the silver in the film. And as such, as the color diodes are formed, you have some of the silver blocking the full color image and it kind of gives you that sepia or i want to say sepia tone. if you watch three kings that kind of had like that uh seep, that bleach bypass look to it and you know feel free to stop me at any time during this presentation for questions okay this is uh i wanted to let you know as far as our color there we go uh when we make color negative film we have to balance it to the different uh, degrees of light, either daylight or tungsten light. So a color negative film, we have two daylight balance films and then two tungsten balance films. Uh, having said that, you can take tungsten light, uh, excuse me, you, could you can take tungsten balance film and you can take it outdoors. You could either put a filter on it or, but that would slow the speed of the film down. Or some filmmakers don't like to uh, put the filter on it and they'll just correct it in post. But with color negative film, we have tungsten balance film and daylight balance film. <clears throat> Let me see here. And I wanted to show you this slide, not to really confuse you, but, or not to bore you, but uh, as cooking, when you follow a recipe, and you have to make sure every time you make the product, it's always the same type of film. So, I mean, I'm sure as filmmakers or those who aspire to be filmmakers, if you buy a roll of film, a 200 speed film, and the next time you used it, it's not 200 speed anymore because the way we made it, we didn't really uh, make it exactly like we did the first time. It's maybe 250. You'd be a little annoyed because that alters the way you, you, um, record an image. How we measure the film is through a, is a characteristic curve with that image right there. Now on the right hand is the actual image of the gentleman sitting at a table with coffee. And on the left is a characteristic curve representative of that image. And we always have to make sure every time we make film that we take a sample we process it, we measure it, and it's always falling within the specifications of that characteristic curve. So I, that's the only reason I really wanted to show you that is that that's how we have to measure the film. Again, it's just like cooking. Cooking, you always have to follow the recipe, and then you taste, you test it by tasting. Well, we can't taste film. We have to test it by science. Uh, Uh, I wanted to show you this slide. Uh, okay. Again, you see the characteristic curve and you see this image on the right of the gentleman. Uh, this characteristic curve, and the reason why I show you this is One of the differences you will find between electronic capture and film capture is with this, what we call straight line portion of the curve. This curve or this line right here, you can see as I'm bringing the cursor up, it kind of curves a little bit at the top. Whoop. How did I do that? has a slight bend on the top and also down what we call the toe region in the shadows. It kind of bends a little bit. And this is called the toe and this is the shoulder. 
That's one of the differences between film and electronic capture. It's that it's the curve. It's whereas electronic capture, it captures the image and it keeps going, increasing, increasing, and then it just stops. Whereas with film, it kind of it doesn't stop right away. It kind of slightly turns and then shuts off. And same thing in the shadows. It kind of slightly cuts off and then flattens out. And that's that's kind of like the uh, little secret parts of uh, not secret parts, but that's the little spice of film that separates it from electronic capture the grain and also these little curves which electronic capture always try to figure out these characteristic curves uh so they can apply it or they can bake it into their look okay uh i show you this image again this is uh george eastman on the left thomas s on the right you notice that camera is a lot smaller I showed you a slide earlier of uh, motion picture film in 35 millimeter width. In 1923, again, appealing to people as ourselves, the masses, uh, how can I allow more people to shoot motion picture film? Because uh, like the Brownie camera, it was smaller and lighter and more people can afford it. 35 millimeter motion picture cameras were very cumbersome. So he invented 16 millimeter in 1923. So basically, and it was really designed as a amateur style format. Uh, and that's the first 16 millimeter motion picture camera. So he's actually started that format, George Eastman. And that's the Model A camera. And then just to let you know, we have a, uh, our website, Kodak Film Lab, uh, excuse me, a Facebook site, Kodak Film Lab Atlanta. And within that site, there's a 16 millimeter uh, cameras group. So join it. Uh, be and basically what I'm trying to do is uh, gather together, uh, interact people who have cameras who know a lot about them with those who want, want to learn or possibly purchase those. And there was somebody who just posted some images that they shot with a Cine Kodak Model A. And I would love to get one of those cameras. Uh, I have uh, the Model B, but I don't have the Model A. But that's the first uh, 16 millimeter camera. Oh, there's no lens there. Uh, okay. Now, 16 millimeter was basically amateur format and a documentary format for many, many years. And then in 1970, uh, Rune Erickson, who I have pictured here, he figured uh, that in order to take 16 millimeter and then make a 35 millimeter print of his documentaries to show it in the theater to allow it to look less grainy, he decided to expose out to where the perforations would be. And then he developed Super 16. And Super 16 is basically 16 millimeter film with single perf. And you see here on the left is Super 16. On the right is Regular 16. The d Regular 16 has perforations on both sides. Uh, nowadays, if you purchase any 16 millimeter film from us, unless specifically uh, request it, like NASA buys double perf for high speed photography. But uh, otherwise, you'll get single perf 16. And single perf 16, you can expose Regular 16 or you can expose out to where the perfs would be, and that's Super 16. And, ba and now, a lot, sometimes people, when they buy uh, film from us, they say, well, what kind of special film do I need to shoot Super 16? You just buy a regular 16 millimeter film, because uh, it's single perf. Uh, Super 16 comes into play by the camera. And that when I say by the camera, by actually taking the gate, and then having it widened by a professional because that, that also you have to adjust the lenses as well because your center of the frame is altered. But it's really driven, Super 16 is not driven by the film, it's driven by the camera. And I'm showing you this image because this is a different, again, a different width of film, 35, 16, regular eight and super eight. But let me update that with a, another, I wanted to show you something. Uh, this slide, this is Super 8 
on the left. And, uh, and it's the same thing that happened with Super 8 as in, okay, there were 16. And then we then the Kodak came out with regular 8, again, to make it more appealing to the, the public. Uh, but what regular 8 was, was really, if you look at double 8 all the way over here, it was 16 millimeter film with regular 8 perforations. It would come in a little magazine. You would shoot one side. You would take the cartridge out, flip it, and shoot the other side. And then you would have to then send it to the lab. And what the lab would do, they would slit it down the middle and then splice it together. And that's how you got your regular age film. Uh, back in 1964, I believe, uh, Kodak came up with Super 8. And the nice thing about that was... It was actually, it was super, it was a uh, eight millimeter in width with super eight perforations. And uh, it came in, I, let me see if I have a picture of that. That's, that's regular eight right there. Uh, do I have, well, super eight cartridges are plastic and they insert right into the camera. I can show you a picture later on of one of my cameras. No, I'll show it to you live. Any questions? Um, I know you mentioned due to COVID-19 that the Kodak lab is closed at the moment, but do you guys ever give any uh, lessons on or seminars on how to handle film? When you say handle film. Uh, or like use film. Oh. As far as exposing it or are you talking about editing it or. Well, I mean, in general, like putting it into the camera or how to handle it and how to edit it. Um, I'm hesitant. Prior to uh, coronavirus, I would say, yeah, we used to buy people in the lab all the time. Um, going forward, we, we, we really have to, we have to address that uh, because we would like that to happen. We're just not sure how to do that under the current uh, guidelines. So uh, I'm not sure who was asking that, but you can. I'll give you my email address and you can send me an email and we can uh, figure out how to do that. Because one thing we noticed in our lab, here, let me just get back to me. Um, the thing about our lab is uh, there's a few of us and we're all up there in years. So we realize, we recognize that one, uh, it's the only lab there's few labs in the world and there's a, a motion picture lab right in Atlanta uh, but the folks who work there that have years of experience we need to start passing that uh, experience on to a new generation because we're not going to be around for forever so we have to try to tackle that and we were we had somebody uh, we have somebody from SCAD Atlanta who has joined our staff but unfortunately with uh and right now, no one's at the lab right now until we reopen. But once we do, we have to start training new people because uh, I'm up there in years, but I'm not really a lab uh, technician. The people who are in the lab are um, they're, they're young at heart, but they're older in age. So we have, we have to pass that knowledge on as far as handling film to, to your question along with it. Um, I'll just say something about Double Eight. Um, I'm reading a lot about it because I ha I've actually people have donated cameras to us, and in a lot of cases they're Double Eight cameras or regular cameras. Uh, I understand there's going to be some film available. I, I know through B and H you can get regular Eight. It's a little tricky as far as how to process it because you're, as you see from those images, you got to expose it and then cut it. But uh, that'd be great if that's. Uh, that becomes available because it's uh, those cameras are all over the place. So stay tuned. Um, oh, I, that's the uh, regular rate. Oh, I, I wanted to show you this. How much time we got here? Because I just wanted to show some images of uh, inside our lab where we process motion picture film. For those who actually use still film, uh, you're used to exposing the roll of film and then putting a developer tank and then washing it and then putting 
into a fixed process and then washing it again. And then you have your negative or, and then you put it on your enlarger and then you, you bring up a, uh, you process the print film and then fix it. And then you have your, you have your print, uh, motion picture film is basically, the, it is basically the same steps, but you're not taking a small roll of still film. You're taking large rolls of either 35 or 16 millimeter. So how do you do that? You have to, uh, this is, uh, this is, as I said earlier, this is the front of our motion, our lab in Atlanta, Kodak Film Lab Atlanta on 2156 Faulkner Road. On the right-hand side is six West Jewett Hills, and that's where the Crawford building was. On the left is where we actually process the negative film. And on the right is where we have our high-end scanner, our spirit scanners. So we take images and convert it from analog to a digital format. Um, so going back to this picture, this is how you process still film. Where we process motion picture film is in this facility right here. And this image, in most cases, what happens is filmmakers come in, they're shooting during the day. Like I'll give you uh, a scenario, uh, The Walking Dead that shoots on 16 millimeter. They will wrap about one o'clock in the morning. They'll come up to our door. No one's at the lab, but they'll drop the film off in this drop box and we process it and get it ready for the next day. So by the end of next, the next day, or if they drop it off at one o'clock in the morning, by the end of that day, LA will have the images. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. That is whoop, the dark room of our, if, I'm going to show you images of the, the lab right now. And this is the dark room of our motion picture lab. And the person who works there, John, John Woodson, uh, he works. You see a bright light right there. But obviously, if that's the dark room, it, he turned that light off. And he's got to load up that processing machine in the dark. So going back to that still process, it's the same steps as far as the tanks. But instead of physically picking up the film and put it into each tank, we actually have a demand driven motion picture processor that if you see, if you can barely see in those uh, uh, the film strips right here, this is what we call leader. There's a blue tint to it. And we take negative film in the dark, we staple it to the leader, and then it's pulled through each one of the tanks. And then you see that gray door in the back. That's actually after the film has been goes through a developer, it then can be exposed to light. And then it's it, so it goes through a little slit there. And this and then you then it comes out into the light part of the processor. And then it goes through the bleach, and the bleach is removed, or the silver is removed, I should say. And then it goes through the drying cabinets, and then the film after it's been. Uh, it dries, it goes on this reel, and the film has been developed. And it runs about 80 feet per... Uh, we do about 5,000 feet per hour, basically. And you'll notice up here this little thing, pull process, little writing up here. We do pull processing and push processing. And that's all driven by how fast we move the, the film through the process. And these are the steps we do as far as processing color negative film. And all those steps right there are done in, the, in this process. This processing machine is 40 years old. It's an Allen processor. It's like, a, it's a fine working piece of art. Uh, and it's processed 11 seasons of The Walking Dead. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. 11, 10, 10 seasons going on to 11. Uh, it's processed uh, Stacy. It's, it's processed hidden figures. 40 years of films have gone through this processor. So I think it's a, it's a historical piece of equipment. And for those in Atlanta or in the Southeast, it, it, you don't have to go to New York. You don't have to go to like UK or any parts of the world, California. This processing machine is in Atlanta. So that's, that's a luxury. 
uh, that this is a black and white photograph process. We do not process black and white film, but I know a lot of filmmakers in Atlanta or in, or in the Southeast, they buy a 16 millimeter or super eight black and white reversal and they process it themselves. If you want it professionally done, you can send it to color lab in Maryland or, uh, I think there's a, uh, a pro eight in California and spectra. They process, but I believe Photochem as well. Okay. How do you take that processed negative now and convert it to a digital file? And basically how we do it is we have a scanner and the scanner, we put the process negative over this light source. The light is then uh, is underneath the film. The film is basically projected into a, let me see my curl there. To a basically, for lack of a better word, a high-end digital camera or a sensor, and that converts it from analog to digital. So basically, your negative is then projected onto a digital camera. And just to show you, this is a. We have spirits. We have a spirit 4K, and we have a spirit HD telecine. We also have at the lab a black magic scanner and that on the table right here is a black magic scanner. Uh, we use that for QC, for archival, for it's, it's very good for testing uh, new cameras. It's good for those who are budget conscious. The film is wound here after it's processed, goes through these rollers and right here is that light source. It and the negative goes right over the light source. It's projected into this box right here in this box is basically a black magic digital camera. And it re it's so that image is basically projected onto the camera and then it shows up here. And now you have your digital file. So once it goes to a digital file, you all are quite familiar with how to work with your, uh, your laptop computers and you use, uh, different softwares as far as Resolve, uh, DaVinci, what have you, as far as doing color correcting or editing. And that's this is just another picture of uh, a scanner. And, and this was the one that we used to have in Rochester. Or maybe it's, I, I think this particular scanner is over at the Eastman house in Rochester. But the negative is put on here after it's been processed. It goes through this configuration and here's the scanner and the light source and the sensor. Uh, so once you do that, then you have your digital intermediate. And digital intermediate, which actually is something that Kodak developed with back in the day, which the Cine site and Cine on equipment. And George State University was one of the first universities to acquire the, the, uh, was it the, the Cine site equipment. Um, they don't longer have it, but basically you're doing is taking images analog and you convert it to a digital file. And from that, you can do all your color manipulation. And that's how it's really been helpful for 16. It's very, a low cost way of uh, acquiring images. And you, depending on the scan you have, you could take 16, you can scan it HD. You could, uh, you could scan it at 2k up to 4k. We can only score uh, scan it up to 4k and you're pulling more information at it. It's, it's beautiful images. Uh, and then once you have your that digital file, you can then either put in it. You could put it on a hard drive and bring it to a theater, DCPs, or you can make a print from that. And there are called Cinevators, where you uh, take in a digital file and then you can record it out to a print film, and you can process that. Uh, when you send film to us, we can process color negative film and we could also do an HD transfer. We could do a black magic scanner and then we can then put it on, but we could also put it on our spirit 2K and 4K. And it's all depending on your cost and your workflow. And we, we have to go on each one of the workflows, but we recommend that you reach out to us We can talk you through as far as, uh, what's the best economic workforce or workflow for you. And that's going back to our facility. The people at our lab, uh, there's Robert, there's John, and then there's Ben. They've had years, well, Robert and John have years of experience working with the lab. So that's, even though 
Codex Lab Atlanta is new under that name. The people in the lab have been around for many, many years, so they have years of experience. And Ben is our, our, our student from SCAD Atlanta who just joined us. And also over at Six West, we have three individuals over there who actually have been years in the business as far as when they work for Crawford. We have DC, our senior colorist. We have uh, Ian McDonald, who is our uh, colorist, junior colorist. And then we have Jeremiah Druke, who is in a post-management -manage position. They can help you as far as determine the workflow. Okay. Uh, a lot of times people ask us, what is the cost to shoot film? I roughly put some numbers together for 16 millimeter. Uh, if you take a hundred foot, uh, excuse me, a 400 foot roll of film, of 16, let me just, uh, it's basically like this can. This can is, uh, it's actually, it's used already, but uh, 400 feet of film for 16 the run time on that is 11 minutes. We can process it normal, do a two case flat scan to a DPX file, and it costs you about a dollar a foot. So, and that's for the scan of the roll of film for processing um, for two, uh, two case scan. So that's for about $400 for 11 minutes to a DPX file. So that gives you, and again, that's. There's a lot of other factors that could go into it, but that's kind of like in a ballpark, I figured out. Uh, let me see. The other thing I just want to show you or tell you, why is film becoming a kind of resurgence? Uh, it's kind of like vinyl records. Uh, as you get used to electronic music or uh, digital music, it's hearing analog record playing. You kind of hear the different melodies, different sound that becomes more attractive to your listening. It's the same thing as for film. As you get used to seeing digital cameras are great. Uh, and Kodak in, in actually invented a digital camera. Uh, but if you get used to those clear images, clean images, uh, going back to this, what movies are all about, you're trying to attract the viewer's attention. When you start adding grain, it automatically, as a viewer, you're saying something's different here and it may invoke an image that you're trying to convey with your moving pictures. Well, I'll just say this, when, being with Kodak as long as I have, it was a time where it was film versus digital. And now I, I, I see, personally, it's, it's more of a film for certain situations and digital for other situations, or even hybrids. They shoot film for certain scenes, and then digital for other scenes. Uh, going back to the other project, Kodak Super 8. Uh, a lot of people ask us about that. With Super 8, we still make Super 8 film, and the, and the reason for that is it just has a different look to it all together. Uh, the Super 8 camera is still, put it this way, it's not dead yet. We're still trying to roll it out uh, with what's happened with the uh, coronavirus. I'm not sure what the present situation is, but... Put this way, I haven't heard anything as far as it's dead yet. So, so hopefully, going to pursue that. Um, what's the other thing? Was, oh, the interesting thing that I'm seeing, I just want to tell you trends uh, as far as scan, going back to scanning. It used to be a, a point in time when uh, we would scan and to the aspect ratio that you wanted. Let me see if I can bring this up. Uh, can you see this? This, uh, let's see, this job spec sheet, does that pop up? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. When we, when you, you drop off or you send us film, we recommend this out. a job spec sheet. And what that is, you fill out your production company name, your, your title and billing or what have you. But you also your different processing techniques you want. Do you want to cross process? Uh, but the film format is it standard 16, super 16, uh, is it 35 millimeter, two perf, three or four perf? But right here, the full frame, we're seeing more of that. In other words, uh, we're seeing, and it's almost full frame over scan, where filmmakers, uh, one second. filmmakers are asking for uh, the perforations. Uh, one is so they can do their own uh, 
image manipulation, but also because it becomes a badge of uh, telling people that this is indeed film with perforation marks. The other thing is film lines. You see uh, a line uh, as the frame, you'll see sometimes the incoming frame or the outgoing frame, whereas before we'd never show you the frame lines, or those would be masked out. Now, for music videos uh, or for art pieces, you're seeing more of those frame lines coming, uh, people requesting that. So it's it's very interesting uh, how the uh, the look has evolved in that, whereas before you'd want to kind of hide those imperfections, and now they're kind of the beauty marks of film. Uh, the other side I want to show you is this. If you go to... Uh, uh, Kodak.com, Go, Cinema Tools. This is a great app. It's free. And I say that because a lot of times people ro buy a roll of film and want to know how much film I, I should buy in each one of the formats and what's the running time. This will calculate it for you right off the bat. And uh, it's a free app. So I, I recommend it. It's not propaganda. It's just a really helpful tool. Uh, the other thing I, I wanted to show you here to some... Again, in front of our lab, I, I show this, and some of you may be in this picture. Uh, when we started those programs, I mentioned it was like five people uh, when we did these Saturday morning programs coming down to the lab. So it's grown to uh, this size, and uh, that tells me there's interest in celluloid. And the nice thing uh, is that it's, it's growing in terms of the uh, – the level of age. There's a younger generation who really want to learn how to use film. So uh, that's always reassuring to me that, that we're seeing that. The other thing I wanted to show you is uh, every Saturday, when we do these Saturday morning programs, we always talk about cameras or different types of cameras. I have one of those cameras. This is a, uh, a K3 or a Kravach uh, 3 camera. Uh, they're not that expensive online. Uh, I wouldn't spend more than a hundred bucks on those. Uh, I got mine in, in uh, at Athens, Georgia, from a filmmaker, and they take hundred foot loads. Uh, I'll show you. I have mine right here. Uh, they're nice, simple cameras, and for those who have shot Super 8 and then want to move up to 16. These 16 millimeter cameras are great, great little learning devices to learn 16 because it's, it takes daylight spools, which are 100 foot in length. So you, daylight spools mean you basically can load it in subdued light. You could load it up. Uh, now, I only have the uh, a K3 and a uh, Bell and Howe camera. Oh, let's put this here. But also, these are self want self-wind camera so it take it runs about 13, 25 seconds per wine and it's a and uh it takes nice images it's not it's not bolex but for the price which was i got it for like 60 bucks uh it was worth it the other camera i have uh let me see uh i have a Bell and Howe again. It's uh, it's uh, the Bell and Howe uh, 240. I got this one for 50 bucks. It's again, it's a uh, a wind up. Actually, I still have film in it. Um, so 100 feet is two minutes and 45 seconds. And this is this camera actually. Uh, um, Orson Welles love this camera, and I only show these because they're a great learning tool. If you want to go from Super 8 into 16, uh, 16 uh, Super 8 cameras. I have one of these Yashica cameras. Uh, it just takes a Super 8 cartridge. So you just plug it in there and you could film. Now we don't process Super 8. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out a lot of people ask us, so who's using film? Who's shooting film? These shows, again, I, you know, I need to update this because this is a, a few years old, but all these films chose celluloid to tell their stories. Hidden Figures was done through Kodak Film Lab Atlanta, or at that point in time was Steve Film. Uh, is there any other ones that were done? Okay. But the, all these were filmed. 
And I, Tanya, was the first film to go through our lab when it was Kodak Film Lab Atlanta. The Florida Project was done through uh, Kodak Film Lab Atlanta. And what was it? The Baby Driver, was the, we did the test. They actually went through Photochem on that one. But all of these were done on film and 16 and 35. We do The Walking Dead for the past 10 seasons. We, uh, we, they, we've been using, uh, or they've been using us for processing uh, their work. And it's done on all 10 seasons were shot on 16 millimeter. And why? Because they felt that the was the most realistic on 16 versus any other format. Uh, so what I wanted to do was, uh, let me see, it's 10, 15 right now. So I wanted to ask, uh, we were supposed to go from like 9 to 10 30 or anything are there any questions uh that folks may have not for the moment is this uh one of the things i wanted to ask uh and you could and i'll give you my email address it's michael dot p as and paul dot brown at codec.com and i also give you uh my cell phone number which is 561 310 5520 so you may email me or you may call me or text me let me know different topics that you would like to have us present on this uh on these programs Again, we um, we started this. Uh, I'm starting this online, and I didn't want to do a, a quite involved presentation or uh, bring one of our speakers in until I, I tested it myself. So we hope to do this every month and different topics um, that uh, be it's on similar specific cameras and what have you. Um, and what we also try to do at the, the lab is on these Saturday programs is we encourage people to bring their 16 millimeter cameras uh, and then start exchanging ideas. Cause like that, that K3 camera, uh, I'll be honest with you. Some people, uh, some people love it and some people, <laughs> some people bite their tongue out about it, but what, there's, there's, it's, it's a quirky camera. And what happens is uh, a lot of people have suggestions so it's almost like, you know, those car shows, where people bring their antique car shows in parking lots and everybody starts talking. That was the intent of the program. So we have to try to do that online. So, uh, we hope to keep doing that now. And, and those who I, I didn't hear earlier, there is a Facebook site of Kodak film lab Atlanta. It's called you know, Kodak film lab Atlanta. It's on Facebook. Please join it. But also there's a, within that page, there's it's called 16 millimeter celluloid cameras we rec we uh, encourage you to join it because i'm trying to match up those people who have film cameras know a lot about film cameras with those who are inquiring more about uh knowledge about how the operations of those cameras are so that's any other questions you may have that's about it yeah okay. i mean may I ask, oh, uh what did you think about the presentation or or I think it's going to be evaluation form. I think in some way. I I enjoyed it. So I, I learned a lot about film that I didn't know about before. Uh, I didn't know you. There were like different sizes. Yep. Uh, I, have, I have other slides, but uh, also um, visit Kodak Motion Picture site. And you look under education. Actually, maybe I could do that here. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. You go. Oh, it's a, oh I want. Because a lot of people don't know this is here. Oh, come on. Where? where, where? One second.
I'm not sure if you get there. Uh, support. Well, if you go into a Kodak Motion Picture site, and uh, okay, it's popping up here. You see, and if you can see my cursor, there's a drop down arrow, and then you'll see educational tools. Okay. Click on that, and then you have filmmaker tools, publications, and you click publications, and I tell you something. Those books are those things on the left hand side, central reference guide for filmmakers, cinematography field guide, color theory. We used to give those books away. Actually, we used to give them away free, but they're and I, I'm not waving the flag. Those are excellent. Those are excellent. Uh, if you really want to learn film, they are fantastic. The other thing I was going to show you, how did I find it? Maybe it was support. Oh, and we're revamping this anyway, because this is even for me, it's it's challenging to find all the. Uh, Why well, I don't want uh, this is actually a nice little thing to I'll open this up. It tells you the difference between uh, and thirty five millimeter. I mentioned three perf, four perf, and two perf. This explains what each one of those. Uh, terminology is and, and how it's used, and also Super 16. It's a nice little device. Anyway, so let me, uh, sorry about that. Uh, but um, you have my telephone number, you have my email. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have things coming up in the future. I, I, I know we're going to have things coming up in, in the future as far as uh, on this site, on these Saturday morning programs. Again, I was just testing. I wanted to see how this worked uh, as far as presentations. And then uh, uh, we'll let the Atlanta Film Society know the next topic. And again, we try to do this once a um, once a month. Okay. All right. Sounds okay, good. Any other, uh, before we leave, any other questions? Oh. Okay, Emma, are you still here? Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know. No. Okay. Did you want to? Uh, we're we're going to wrap it up now, but did you want to uh, uh, say anything about the Atlanta Film Society? Any, uh, what's the uh, latest on the uh, drive ins? Sure. Um, so I know Chris uh, Escobar, who is our executive director and also the owner of the Plaza, um, is doing drive in uh, movies both at the Plaza and at Dad's Garage. Um, if you just go online to the Plaza Atlanta site, uh, you should be able to find information about screenings and stuff like that. Um, and then from an, the education side, we have uh, a couple of like classes in the works. We have actually tomorrow a storyboarding workshop. That's only $40 um, with a great, uh, great, great filmmaker. It's gonna be awesome. There's still some spots open for that. Um, other than that, I did drop uh, in the chat a link to a survey that we are going to be using um, that is just helpful for us to have people fill out. Um, it shouldn't take more than a minute or two. Uh, super simple, but it's very helpful for us uh, to see who's attending our educational programming, what people want to see in the future, that kind of stuff. So I also thank everyone for coming. It's, uh, it's great that people are still engaged even when we can't be together in person. Uh, <laughs> you know, I meant to ask you, when is the, because I, I saw the Atlanta Film Festival is going to be in September. I know it's every part everything's up in the air, but is it September? Were those the new dates? Yes. Um, our current dates are September 17th through 27th. Right now. September. Yep. Okay. 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 All right. Well, thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you very much. Okay, take care, all. You have a good one.